Hi everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us um, for this uh, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey CME session. My name is Scott Merdler. I'm one of the pediatric oncologists here at Rutgers uh, Cancer Institute of New Jersey in New Brunswick. And today we're going to be talking about, um, as this se third session in this series, talking about the mechanics of immunotherapy in pediatric oncology. Um, talking about CARs, as CAR T cell, releasing the brakes and racing into the future. Um, and a few house note, um, <clears throat> to me, housekeeping things. Um, everyone has been muted um, and please save your questions until the end. You can place them into the chat or um, if we have some time, you can unmute yourself for that. So uh, learning objectives for today um, is the, for this series in general to develop diagnosis and treatment strategies to explain the importance of screening and accurate diagnosis, uh, discuss disease management and targeted therapies, and assess available clinical trials. And we'll get into some um, more specifics about this particular talk in terms of immunotherapy a little later in terms of our learning objectives for today. For this um, session, um, physicians are, and providers are eligible for one AMA PRA category one credit, and nurses are eligible for one ANCC uh, contact hour for their participation in this live webinar. In order to receive credit, everyone must complete the post webinar evaluation by March 22nd, and this information will be shared with you via email after the webinar. We just wanted to thank the rest of the planning committees for these sessions. Um, and these are the disclosures for all of the sessions in general. Uh, for me specifically, I have no uh, uh, relevant disclosures. And all of the content has been peer reviewed um, by other uh, members of the planning committee. So, moving uh, on specifically into our talk today about immunotherapy, I have divided this talk into two different parts. We're going to be talking first about reviewing the general principles of T cell function pathway um, and how it relates to tumor, tumor immunology. Um, and then we're going to start to talk about the variety of different immunotherapy options in the, and their role in pediatric oncology. And we'll be talking about oncolytic viruses, cancer vaccines, CAR T cell therapy, and checkpoint immunotherapy. So why are we talking about this? Why is this important? As you can see here, uh, this is, oops, sorry. Um, this is, um, um, these are how we've been doing within pediatric oncology. Um, and sorry, this is sliding faster than I thought. Um, how we've been doing within pediatric oncology in terms of our um, mortality rate. So as you can see here on the yellow line, within leukemia and lymphoma, we've actually been doing really well over the past couple of decades. So we've been able to reduce um, tox uh, mortality, been able to increase our cure rates within leukemia and lymphoma. Unfortunately, for all other cancers here in blue, we haven't done as good of a job. Our mortality rate hasn't significantly declined, which begs to say that we need newer therapies, more novel therapies to really help us increase our cure rates in, in those cancer types. Um, and what are those cancer types? Uh, what I mean, what are those treatments, those novel treatments? So there's a lot of them on the market. Some of them you may have heard of um, in terms of CAR T cells, things like Kimria, um, in terms of checkpoint immunotherapy, Keytruda. These are things that our patients are hearing about um, on TV. There are commercials for it, and it's very popular in the news. That's why we're going to be going over this today. And as you can see in the background here, this um, uh, figure, uh, there's this car racing along within our blood. And the reason for that is because, as we'll talk about it, there's this analogy of talking about kind of turning on the immune system with all of these immunotherapies, or sort of like pressing on the gas for our immune system or releasing the brakes. And we'll break that down a little bit further going forward. So starting with just our basics of T-cell anti-tumor immunology. So here, this is um, going back, taking us back into medical school, thinking about our immune system in terms of our innate immunity and our adaptive immunity. Innate immunity um, it reacts fast. It's what we're what's there, what we're born with. Um, it, fa it acts against pathogens in a very stereotypic patho pathogen specific manner. Um, 
and it's non-specific. Um, so there's no memory to it. So it's just kind of they see something that's abnormal and they go and they attack it. Um, as opposed to our adaptive immunity, that's a little bit of a slower response. And that is special because it has actual memory features, right? So that's our B cells and our T cells that are able to adapt and react to pathogens in a very specific manner and increases this reaction over time. And this is where our uh, immunotherapy is really trying to um, take advantage of that adaptive immunity. So what happens specifically? So um, we have our antigen presenting cells and our antigen presenting cells, which are things like um, uh, our dendritic cells and the like, they present these MHC class molecules with a foreign peptide on it. Our T cells come along and they have their T cell receptor on it. And that binds to it, that recognizes that foreign peptide and sends a positive signal to our naive T cell, which in theory should activate that T cell. However, that's not exactly how it works. There needs to be additional signals that happen throughout the T cell to really get that T cell response. And what is that called? That's something called co-stimulation. So we need a secondary um, signal, a second um, sign that really this is truly something abnormal in order for our T cell to get turned on. Because we don't want to just turn on our T cells all the time because that could have very um, negative impacts. So we have another set of molecules, something called CD28 on our T cell, which binds to B71 or B72 on the antigen presenting cell. And once that binds, now that is when we actually get that co-stimulation, that that positive signal for the T cell, and the T cell is able to turn on. It has a very strong response, very act high activation with cytokine release. Um, but we need to balance that out as well, because if we did that, like I was mentioning before, then we just have uninhibited T cell response that is going to lead to cytokine release, cytokine storm, and all kinds of problems. So what we have is balance act balancing that activation with co-inhibition. So at the same time, we have another molecule on our T cell, something called CTLA-4, which we'll get back to a little later in the talk. Um, and if that is recognized um, on the T cell and that binds to B71 and B72, then you get a balanced co-inhibition. And that leads to the appropriate amount, the, the leveled amount of response from the T cell um, to move forward. And the reason why this is important, this was um, what won Dr. Honjo and Dr. Allison the Nobel Prize in 2018 was for um, the understanding and characterization of CTLA-4 and its role in co-inhibition for T cell response. Um, and without that, and what they found in some of their seminal papers is that without that T cell co-inhibition, uh, which we're showing here in this figure right over there, without that, if that were blocked, um, what we found, what they found is that um, CTLA-4 inhibition led to major activation uncontrolled T cell response. And as you can see here in these knockout mice over here, um, led to a smaller, uh, sicker mouse, as well as with uh, very inflamed and engorged lymphoid tissue because of all of that T cell response. And unfortunately, shorter lifespan and death of these mice. So really we do, it showed that we really do need, not just for um, uh, immune um regulation and and pathogen fighting, but also just for, for our everyday life that these uh, mice, these knockout mice, were not able to survive uh, with uh, CTLA-4 inhibition and blockade. And this is really what we use also in infection, right? So if you have a healthy cell um, and that presents the MHC molecules with self-peptides, so saying like, hey, this is a normal cell within our body um, presenting self peptides. Our T cells can come along, um, but they're, they're not going to bind to those MHC molecules and that foreign peptide because they're recognizing it as self, right? So the tissues are left unharmed. There's no T cell response. However, if you have an infected cell, um, what we end up finding is that that foreign peptide is presented on that MHC molecule, and then we end up with T cell activation and killing of that infected cell. So we kind of think about it very similarly within tumor immunology, right? So we have a tumor cell that's presenting these neoantigens or mutated um, 
uh, DNA, right? So you have your near antigen that's being presented on your MHC molecule. Your T cell comes along, it recognizes that, and in theory should be able to then have T cell response and to kill that tumor cell. However, we know that that's not exactly what happens, right? Uh, unfortunately, we know that tumor cells are able to get around that. They're able to regulate, re replicate, and get around um, our T cell response, and they're having that those mechanisms of tumor um, immune escape. So that's why that's where immunotherapy is coming in. So I wanted to kind of take us back and go um, talk about all the different types of tumor immunotherapy that we have seen over the years. So the initial types of immunotherapy that were utilized were nonspecific immunotherapy. So those were ones just to kind of augment the immune system. They were nonspecific to the, the patient's tumor or cancer type. And they were often given in combination with other cancers, so uh, cancer treatment, so like chemotherapy or radiation. And the thought process was that just to try to heighten the immune response. So those were things like interferons or interleukins, and those were just kind of those cytokines that we know that the T cells um, uh, usually release when they get activated. The problem with that is, as you can imagine, because it was a nonspecific um, augmentation, you just got nonspecific activation of the immune system and damage of the inflammatory with an inflammatory response because of all of those cytokines kind of running around and wreaking havoc on the body. Fast forwarding a little bit, um, there's a lot of talk about cancer vaccines and especially more recently since COVID, there has been some more discussion about cancer vaccines and thinking about RNA vaccines and how their history has been within cancer vaccines. Um, and there's a, the goal of the cancer vaccine is similar to other disease vaccines or, or infectious vaccines is to activate the immune system, right? So using a variety of different sources, whether it's tumor cells, tumor antigens, peptides, circulating DNA or RNA. And the, the point of it is to try to teach the immune system how to recognize specific cancers as a threat. And therefore, they, that's able to then mobilize the T cells and utilize our own immune system to attack the cancer. And how does this work? Um, so there's two different ways that this can happen. One of which is um, actually taking that, that tumor DNA and uh, implanting it into a virus and then into a vector and then inject that viral vector into our, the patient. And then once that happens, um, our normal immune system, our dendritic cells, take up the, that genetic material that's in that vector. Another way to do that is to take our uh, neoantigen and directly implant it into dendritic cells, ex vivo, meaning in the lab, um, outside of the person, and then use those dendritic cells that now have those neoantigens that are now um, prime to those new antigens and inject those dendritic cells into the patient. Either way, um, the end result is that those dendritic cells inside of our the, the patient start to mature uh, and they start to produce tumor antigens. Once that happens, then the dendritic cell is able to display those tumor antigens. Those, um, they travel to the lymph nodes and they activate our T cells. Once our T cells are activated, and now that they're primed to it, well, our T cells are able to then go and circulate through the body, and they're able to recognize that tumor cell and bind directly to it, St uh, activating those T cells and stimulating tumor um, attack of those tumor cells that are expressing specifically that antigen. And then, of course, that leads to tumor cell lysis, and it releases additional antigens into the bloodstream. And now we have more T cells that are recognizing those antigens, getting further propagation of that T cell and immune response. So how are these cancer vaccines being used in pediatrics? Um, there's a lot of data and a lot of use about vaccines in terms of things like hepatitis vaccine, uh, B vaccination to prevent liver carcinoma or something more um, that we uh, all know about um, is HPV vaccination to prevent cervical cancer. But that's not um, utilizing the patient cancer um, the patient's specific tumor to treat their cancer. So there are some barriers to that type of thought process. Um, so um, Things like their paucity of antigens within pediatric oncology. So uh, we know in pediatric oncology that 
Um, our younger patients, are, um, the types of tumors that they have, there just are not as many um, antigens or mutations that we see as we do in adult tumors. So we can't exploit, there, aren't, there isn't as much to exploit for vaccine generation. Um, and also, by the time that these are being used, it's often um, patients have already received aggressive immunotherapy, I mean, excuse me, chemotherapy which leads to significant immunosuppression. Um, so if you're already immunosuppressed, if you've already received lots of chemotherapy that has decreased your white blood cell count and you're leukopenic or, or, or neutropenic, then you're not necessarily having that same T cell response. Um, and the, the thought is that you're not gonna be able to mount the same um, response to that vaccine when you're exposed to it. Um, so there's some different things um, that that we think about when we when we uh, are worried about that in terms of that immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, um, how that specifically also act, um, dampens these activated T cells. Um, so now we're trying to get around these different barriers, thinking about combination with some checkpoint therapies, which we'll talk about later this morning, um, and different ways to try to um, augment that and still be able to activate those T cells for further anti-tumor response. So some thinking about those combinations. Um, but these are still ongoing trials. Um, there are a number of them um, that are out there and um, that are available uh, that are available through clinical trial for patients to enroll. Um, many of them are with um, specifically for brain tumors and other types of CNS tumors. But um, that this type of research, this line of research, is still ongoing. Um, the next type of um, immunotherapy that we are talking about today is oncolytic virus therapy. So what that uh, does is, if you think about a virus that is exposed to the system, uh, or the normal system, in normal cells, what we would see is that it gets taken up into the cell, and usually we have an interferon response um, that um, gets released when our normal cells um, um, are infected with a virus. However, in cancer cells, there is no interferon response, and that becomes important in terms of what the next step. Because in um, when you have that normal uh, interferon signal, it's able to help our normal cells or healthy cells prevent viral replication, right? So that's how we're able to combat viruses uh, that we get infected with. It does not, uh, we hope that our cells do not all get infected and um, get harmed. However, when we have no interferon signal within our cancer cells, they're not able to protect themselves, right? So um, we still get viral replication in those cancer cells. And uh, vir oncolytic virus therapy uh, takes advantage of that because the thought is that then with that viral replication, eventually that tumor cell is going to um, have cell death um, and release all of these cytokines and tumor antigens. And then once that happens, there's a few different ways that this uh, process gets propagated and continued. One is that those viruses then go on to infect other cancer cells, and you just get more virus propagated within the system, and it continues this um, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, but then we also see that those um, that we have our normal cells in terms of our immune system coming in with our dendritic cells and our T cells, recognizing those um, cytokines and tumor antigens, they get home to that area of cancer um, and then lead to T cell activation, generation of the anti-tumor response. Um, so there are preclinical studies and phase one clinical trials within pediatrics, specifically within, again, uh, a lot of this is in neuro-oncology um, and non-CNS solid tumors, that we've seen that they've demonstrated safety of oncolytic virus therapy, but unfortunately, we have not seen objective responses yet. However, that, that safety, that lack of toxicity within these therapies suggests that these therapies might be able to be safely combined with other cancer, anti-cancer therapeutics. So here's a list of just some of those clinical trials which are, are open and being um, run for um, oncolytic virus therapy in pediatrics. And then something that um, many people probably know on this call about um, are monoclonal antibodies. And those are still within the realm of immunotherapy. Um, so in general, monoclonal antibodies, there's um, different types of antibodies, which is shown in this figure on the side here, uh, whether there's rodent antibodies, chimeric, which is a fusion of them, humanized or human antibodies. 
Um, and the structure of them is that on the top of it, uh, we have this antigen specific fab domain, and then we have our constant domain on the bottom here. Um, and these antibodies, uh, depending on which one we're talking about, they bind to cancer cells. Um, they stimulate destruction uh, via complement or effector cell activation. Um, and there's a few different ways that that happens, whether it's just direct signaling because of the, the um, binding of the antibody, uh, there can be complement mediated cytotoxicity, antibody dependent cell mediated toxicity, or anti antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis. So a few different ways that different antibodies can function or cause cancer cell death. Um, and ideally, when we're utilizing um, monoclonal antibodies, um, the target has wide expression, so that it should be very widely expressed on our tumor cells, but hopefully very limited or no expression on normal cells, right? Because if you're giving an antibody that's also expressed on many of our normal cells, then that antibody is going to bind to our normal cells and cause a lot of toxicity. So you're looking for, when you're when we're looking for ideal targets um, for cancer therapy, we want something that's pretty much only expressed as much as possible on the tumor cell and not on our normal healthy tissues. So there's, there are a number of different types of monoclonal antibodies that we utilize within pediatric oncology. Probably the most well-known is rituximab, uh, which is an anti-CD20. Uh, it's using B-cell leukemias and lymphomas. Um, um, another one is uh, gemtuzumab. So again, each of these have a specific target. So this is anti-CD33, and it's FDA approved for AML. Um, Brintuximab bidotin, which is an anti-CD30, um, which has an antibody drug conjugate, so it's delivering a payload, a toxic poison to those um, tumor cells, and that's been FDA approved for Hodgkin lymphoma and um, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Um, and this is just a schematic of how that works, is how you have your antibody with these kind of um, purpley um, circles on it, and that's your payload, that's the, the poison, right? So it binds, it gets uh, endocytosis, it uh, gets trafficked into the cell, and then that, um, that payload, that poison that um, gets released. Um, so here it's releasing MMAE, um, and that then binds to tubulin and causes um, cell arrest, uh, cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. Um, a newer um, monoclonal antibody that's um, being utilized more and more is something called dinutuximab, and this is an anti-GD2, um, and that is uh, approved for the use in neuroblastoma uh, and has been incorporated into standard care for neuroblastoma, but there's also ongoing trials to um, evaluate its efficacy in osteosarcoma and other soft tissue sarcomas. We have bevacizumab or avastin, which is a um, VEGF inhibitor. Um, so there's a bunch of different ones that we utilize within pediatric oncology. So I'm changing gears a little bit more is to CAR T cell therapy. Um, so this is Emily Whitehead, uh, who is one of one of the first uh, was the first pediatric patient who uh, enrolled on one of the CAR T cell therapy trials, um, and um, well, she really paved the way for the use of CAR T cell therapy within pediatrics. So just going back and reviewing exactly what CAR T cell therapy is. So CAR T cell, which stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cell, um, what is it exactly? So um, it has, uh, there's been different generations of the CAR T cell, but they're pretty similar in the sense that we have our extracellular domain and our intracellular domains. The extracellular receptor has target specificity. So this is that monoclonal antibody. So they're all specific CAR T cells. So if you, just like we were talking a minute ago about our monoclonal antibodies that are specific to different CD20, CD33, you can have a CAR T cell that is CD19, CD20, CD33. So that's what our extracellular receptor is and has that specificity. The intracellular domain here on the bottom provides that T cell activation. And it gives the co-stimulation signals, um, and there's a variety of different types of co-stimulation domains that have been utilized in the different generations of CAR T cell therapy. And the great thing about that is it bypasses that need for that MHC class binding that we talked about at the very beginning when we were talking about tumor immunology, is that these CAR T cells, they don't need to have the T cell receptor binding to that MHC class molecule. It bypasses that because as soon as this extracellular domain 
um, recognizes its target. It sends that signal down through um, the receptor and it stimulates the intracellular component, which now activates the T cell. So um, here is a schematic of a CAR T cell now that has been manufactured. Here we have our extracellular domain and our intracellular components. Um, our extracellular domain is that monoclonal antibody. It's going to recognize that tumor cell. Once it does that, it sends that now in the intracellular component that um, signal to simulate and activate the T cell, and then the T cell is able to attack our tumor cell. So how do we get CAR T cells? Um, so the common way, um, the the what we usually are doing right now is that we actually it's patient specific. Um, so you're uh, apheresing, so you're hooking up your patient to a uh, apheresis machine. Uh, you're removing their blood, um, spinning it down, removing their T cells. You take their T cells, um, you bring them over to the lab, and they get manufactured. You have to insert that viral gene uh, for the, the chimeric receptor into the T cell. Um, and then it takes some time to incubate. You grow millions and millions of CAR T cells. And then once those are ready, which takes a couple of weeks, then you can go and infuse the, the CAR T cells, which are patient specific, back into the patient. And it's able to do what we were just looking at in that schematic. Um, so, if you remember, we were talking about uh, Emily Whitehead, um, who now. About an 80 to 90 percent response, um, uh, complete remission at one month. Um, so here, this is um, months in remission. So if we look over here in the very beginning, uh, we have a great response rate. Um, but however, over time, as we can see here, in this um, probability of continued remission decreases. So about 30 to 35 percent will either lose their CAR T cell or have relapse, and this is a CD19 initial trial, we, we see that they have CD19 positive or negative relapses within those first six months. So our CAR T cells are not perfect. Uh, either patients are losing duration of response, so they're not responding to it anymore because of those relapse, or those um, uh, T CAR T cells are not able to uh, sustain within the patient over longer periods of time. So, uh, subsequent um, generations of CAR T cells are trying to combat that, trying to find ways to help that uh, the, the CAR T cells are more durable within the, the body, that they um, are able to continue to propagate and uh, be present within the body for longer periods of time, or thinking about other ways around those CD19 positive or negative relapses. More recent data, which is long, some of our now long-term data for CAR T cell therapy, and this is from that same um, initial trial. Um, this is the Ileana trial, it's called, um, and it was a global trial um, using Tisogen Leblusil. Um, and what we see here is that we had an overall response rate of 80 about 80% in pediatric and young adult patients who had relapse or refractory B cell leukemia. Um, and uh, excitingly, about 60% of them remain relapse-free at 12 months, right? Um, and then when we think about in terms of follow-up, further follow-up in terms of um, event-free survival, uh, how many of them have been able to survive without an event, meaning like a relapse, um, uh, we see that uh, that further follow-up was about at 40 months. Um, so we're starting to get there and we're making progress within um, these CAR T-cell therapies. One other... Did not talk. Um, I see that something got, sorry, one slide got um, deleted, but um, blinitumumab is another type of immunotherapy um, and that we're using more in pediatric oncology now. Um, and that has been helping us in terms of our um, response rates within pediatric oncology. So we'll skip over that because that got deleted, sorry. Um, in terms of what, what uh, CAR T cells we're utilizing right now, so the FDA approved CAR T cells are the CD19 positive uh, CAR T cells. Um, and there's a few different ones from a few different drug companies. Um, they have different um, FDA approvals, whether it's for ALL, lymphomas, 
um, and as such, a lot of them are approved for adults, um, with uh, Kim Ryer or Chiswick Jen Lucille being the one that's approved for uh, FDA approved for pediatric ALL. But there's a lot of research still going on in terms of other types of CAR T cell. Like I was mentioning before, since we know that some of those initial pediatric patients uh, um, suffered relapse um, from either CD19 positive or negative, that's why there's other types of CAR T cells, whether it's CD22, CD33 for AML, and in other cancer types as well. So we talked a little bit about dinatuximab earlier, about anti-GD2. That's being investigated in terms of inserting that into it as a CAR T cell therapy and a few other targets. And again, because um, pretty much if any monoclonal antibody, we can try to um, use that part of it of the FC receptor and insert that into a CAR T cell to utilize as a CAR T therapy. <clears throat> But CAR T cells are not perfect. Um, they are extremely expensive, um, so there are limitations in terms of its cost. Um, almost $500,000 to manufacture these CAR T cells. Um, so now there's also some studies going on about um, cost-benefit analysis in terms of uh, utilizing CAR T cells and the timing of CAR T cells, um, whether we use that earlier in therapy and how we use that in relation to um, standard stem cell transplant. The complexity of manufacturing them. So we talked about before that we have to afreeze the patient, and then we have to collect those cells, and then they need to have the viral vector inserted, and then it takes weeks for those to get um, manufactured and manipulated in in the laboratory. There's also a very significant um, side effect profile, and we'll get into some of that in a second in terms of this CRS or cytokine release syndrome. Uh, it has a specific neurotoxicity syndrome, prolonged cytopenias, and B-cell aplasia, especially with these CD19 cars, because you're, you're, um, these CAR T cells are kind of scavenging the body for all of our B-cells, our CD19 and CD20 positive cells, so it leads to B-cell aplasia. Um, but a lot of that that we've been talking about has mainly been in leukemias. Um, so what about our solid tumors? Those have been difficult to treat with CAR T cells, unfortunately, and that has to do with um, the environment that our solid tumors live in, right? So we have this very regular um, inhibitory environment um, that is filled with uh, stroma um, and fibrin sheets. So it's really hard for those CAR T cells to actually get into those solid tumors to have um, a specific T cell response. So we mentioned um, cytokine release syndrome, um, and that is that, um, as you see on this bottom slide here, as our CAR T cells are being bound and um, stimulating those T cells, we're getting all this release of these cytokines and tons of those cytokines. And the higher the tumor burden, the more um, tumor cells that are getting destroyed and have more activation of our T cells. So therefore, we're getting more cytokine release. Um, and the clinical presentation of cytokine release syndrome includes fevers, headaches, rash, and it can get as um, severe in terms of um, other organ toxicity, hypotension, capillary leak and shock, ARDS, um, DIC, and then multi-organ failure. The neurotoxicity includes um, mild confusion, word fighting difficulty, so we pay very close attention to our uh, neurologic exam um, and when these patients are receiving CAR T-cell therapy and afterwards. Um, we do have different therapies for cytokine release syndrome, and we're getting better and better at that as time goes on in terms of our supportive care, uh, which, um, depending on how severe the CRS is, sometimes it can be um, just supportive care, but then um, we have certain interleukin therapies, things like tocilizumab that we're able to use or steroids to help dampen that cytokine release syndrome. Um, and we have specific grading criteria that we use for CRS syndrome, um, and um, the more severe it is, um, we have algorithms for how to go about and treating it. So where do we go from here with our CAR T cells? Um, so here on the all the way on the end, we have our inactive standard CAR. So that's kind of what I was showing you before. Here's our um, extracellular domain, intracellular domain. Um, and in order for that to happen, um, we need our active CAR needs to bind. It has dimerization leading to NF kappa B um, signaling with active proliferation. Um, and then you just have an uncontrolled response. So one thought or one way around um, this uncontrolled response is to use what they're calling an active go cart. Yes, there's a lot of silly puns here. Um, and it leads to a more controlled response. And what that does is that it um, 
it separates that NF kappa B and NFAT signaling uh, from the CAR T cell. So what you have is that some of the signal is coming from the CAR T cell, but then some of it also you have to give an additional medication or antibody to help with that dimerization and leading to that NF kappa B. And then together you get actually T cell signaling. So this lets you really control how many or how much of a response you're getting or activation you're getting from those CAR T cells. Because without it, that T cell, that CAR T cell is inactive. Another way, another thought process is the opposite. It's, this is called a sidecar, so more of kind of suicidal, we think of it, um, and that we have our activated CAR T cell, and if it's you're having too much response, what you can do is give another antibody that leads to dimerization and leads to actual apoptosis and suicide or death of um, the CAR T cell itself. So if you're having you know, cytokine release syndrome, or for whatever reason you want to stop the CAR T cell um, therapy, you would give this additional therapy to kill off those um, CAR T cells. Beyond that, there's a whole garage, um, pun intended, of different types of therapies that we're utilizing and developing um, with CAR T cells. Um, so that can be, you know, they're talking, um, there's, um, development of what we're calling a self-driving car uh, with chemokine receptors or an armored car, which is using um, implementing both CAR T-cell um, thought process as well as immune checkpoint receptor, which we'll talk about in the next um, few minutes. Um, so there's a bunch of different ones. The other area of interest are these tandem cars or dual cars. And what that is doing is it's utilizing, um, exploiting two different receptors. So when we were first talking about those traditionals, those initial CAR T cells were only CD19 positive. Here, an example would be if you're trying to generate a CD19 and CD22. So, right, so we knew, we talked about how those CD19 patients, a lot of them um, ended up with CD19 negative relapses. So it meant that the CAR T cell was eliminating all the CD19 positive leukemia cells, but then the CD19 negative, CD22 positive leukemia cells proliferated. But if you generated a CAR T cell that attacks both of them, then maybe you're able to eliminate or decrease that risk of relapse. So there's two different ways of doing that, whether that one CAR T cell has two domains, two uh, uh, receptors on the same structure, or um, dual cars, meaning two separate cars inserted into the same T cell, one for CD19, one for CD22. And that can be interchanged with any of the other antigens or uh, receptors that of interest. So other um, areas, oh, here's that slide about um, lenitumumab, so I apologize that it got uh, moved around. But um, so there's things called bites, which are bispecific T-cell engagers. Um, the big one that we're utilizing within pediatrics right now is something called lenitumumab, and that is an anti-CD19 and CD3. So what you see here is that this little thing here in the middle is this is the bite antibody, um, and it has receptors both for CD3 and CD19 in red. And by doing that, it's able to kind of really link the T-cell because CD3 um, is a T-cell um, activator. So the, that green is, activate, is binding to our T-cell, activating it, and it's bringing it into close proximity with our CD19 are red over here that's in our cancer cell, recognize our cancer cell, bring them in close proximity, um, creating that cytolytic synapsis, so really close proximity enough now that you have that uh, T-cell activated from CD3, it's able to attack that tumor cell that's right next to it now and kind of bound to it. Uh, we're using that technology um, as well in other uh, tumor types, like um, with um, another antibody that's anti-GD2 and CD3 positive for neuroblastoma. Um, and there's many more that are kind of coming down the pipeline um, that are being developed in terms of anti-CD33 for AML, anti-CD123, uh, so a bunch of different um, exciting novel therapies in the future to come. Um, so then in the last few minutes, I wanted to also talk about immune checkpoints because we hear a lot about those. So going back to our uh, thought processes from the beginning about our antigen presenting cells that present those foreign peptides on the MHC molecule, and we have our T cell receptor that binds to it and recognizing it, um, activating our T cell. We talked about earlier how we need that um, that balance of co-stimulation and co-inhibition in order to have the appropriate response, right? And we needed that with something called CTLA-4. Um, so the immune checkpoints inhibitors are utilizing that CTLA-4 pathway or some of the other ones that um, are giving that in co-inhibition. And if you block that co-inhibition, 
um, that's when uh, we're able to make sure that the T cell is activated. So another one is PDL1, right? So normally um, when we have binding of our um, MHC molecule on the tumor cell and our TCR, T cell receptor on the T cell, it's able to get activated and kill off the tumor cell. But if there's PDL1 on the tumor cell and that binds with PD1 on the T cell, you have co inhibition, you have inhibition of our T cell, and it leads to the tumor cell being able to um, escape our immunity. Right? So that's why we're using things called like PDL1 inhibition. So if you're blocking that, that T cell is not getting inhibited, and now we're not, um, we're able to kill off the tumor cell. And again, that's being utilized in different ways, um, whether it's just it's monoclonal antibody itself, um, if you're utilizing it um, within bispecific antibodies, CAR T cell therapy, a few different ways. Um, so CD CTLA-4 blockade has been around for a while. These are some of those initial seminal papers about its inhibition um, and how it's been used and able to generate a T cell response. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm going to um, move forward a little bit. This is some of that initial data within metastatic melanoma in adults, but it really paved the way for the way that we were able to utilize um, immunotherapy, these Im immune checkpoints, um, in comparison to standard chemotherapy. Um, um, but unfortunately, they have not been as successful in many pediatric solid tumors. But the one success that we've had was is in uh, within um, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and the reason for that is because Hodgkin lymphoma does have, um, does express um, PD-1, um, a mutation that 9P24.1 alteration in Hodgkin lymphoma leads to increased expression of pd one which we are able to um, take advantage of um, by using anti-PD-1 um, PD therapy in uh, Hodgkin lymphoma. And that has led to FDA approval for um, uh, PDL1 inhibitors within Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, unfortunately, um, the anti PD1 therapies in the rest of our solid tumors has really not been as much as we expected. Um, it's really a lot of our other solid tumors have showed low anti tumor activity, um, and really only a few responses were uh, observed in those PD1, PL1 positive tumors. So even though they're expressing it, they're taking advantage of it and giving an anti-PDL1 therapy has not been as successful um, in getting an observed response within those tumor types. And the thought process for this is because, like we mentioned earlier, is that the tumor mutational burden in pediatric cancers is pretty low compared to others. So if you look over here on, on the right, many of these adults, you know, lung squamous, lung cancers, melanoma, um, have lots of mutational burden. But then when we get to some of our more common pediatric cancers, there's a much lower mutational burden. So the, the, the number of mutations that we see um, are a lot fewer, and so there's less for us to take advantage of. Um, and because of that, PDL1 um, expression in pediatrics is kind of limited. Um, it's just not as frequent uh, on our pediatric tumors as uh, it is in many of the adult tumors. Um, but we're still ongoing and, uh, and hoping to find some responses. So there are many active uh, uh, clinical trials for pediatric cancers uh, using anti PD1, PDL1 therapies. Um, and in the future, what we're trying to do uh, with subsequent trials is to get around that. Um, so overcoming that in those resistance. Um, so thinking about combination therapies um, and trying to sensitize the tumors to checkpoint blockade. So there is a lot more um, to come down the pipeline for these uh, checkpoint immunotherapies. And then also another new area of interest is the role of the microbiome and how that impacts um, checkpoint efficacy, including activation of our T cells, expansion of our anti-tumor T cells, and really how the microbiome is affected by nutrition or the prior chemo and radiation that we give antibiotics and the such. So um, I hope that through today, um, I've given you um, some information about uh, T-cell co-stimulation inhibition and how it's regulated by immune checkpoints, which is essential for immune surveillance and tumor immune escape. Um, that yes, tumor immunotherapy is a very broad term with lots of different types of therapeutics. Um, currently, CAR T-cell therapy is approved for limited indications in pediatrics. Um, and while there is mediocre clinical outcome in pediatrics for immune checkpoint therapy, it has lots of potential and future research within other clinical trials.
So I just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions, my email is here and I'm happy um, to take questions from the chat or if you wanted to unmute yourself. Um, and our next session, upcoming session, is going to be on June 8th um, by Dr. Karen Long Trainer talking about the bio, um, bio social model of pain management. So we can give another minute for any questions. If not, we can also give people some time back for their day. All right, well, thank you all for joining and have a great day.